Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, let's continue from where we left. Uh, in your PDFs, we are at the bottom of page 33, page 51 for you guys in hard copy. Uh, so we just finished talking about uh, vision and uh, being a strong leader quite in, uh, intensively. Um, let's move on to the next section. It talks about a strong church, a local church is a church where uh, there is a balance on the emphasis on the word of God and on the spirit of God. Okay, uh, doctrine. <laughs> okay, we are strengthened by the word and by the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Acts 20, 32, Apostle Paul, he writes, the word of God builds us up. Right? Uh, it's such a beautiful language. Uh, you know the exercise I made you all do last year, no? Psalm 119. Uh, <clears throat> um, so the word of God builds us up. Okay, you think about you building a, a building. You're building a building. Okay, uh, you know from the foundations of it to the plan to the structure to the cement to the materials that you would choose to use. <clears throat> Everything you would want to be, you know, the best, like the strong irons, you know, iron bars. In all of that, you would want to have the best. And so that's exactly the language that's being used here is that the word of God builds you. Right? It nurtures you. It nourishes you. It, it, uh, you, you are growing. It, it allows you to grow, right? It, it creates a capacity in you, in you to grow spiritually as well. So that's what the word of God does. And the Holy Spirit, he strengthens us. Can someone read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16? Or I'll read it for us if you... Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. So it says that according to the riches of his glory, sorry, Anand. Okay. So according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened by the power through his spirit in your inner being. Okay, strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Uh, you think about Acts chapter two uh, or in Acts chapter one when Jesus says, "You will, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive." Yeah. Um, so He is power, the Spirit of God. He is raw power. I I heard Reynard Bonke. You heard Reynard Bonke. Uh, he gives this a very simple example of um, a car, uh, a vehicle having power steering and manual steering. How many of you drive? Okay. okay so, so how many of you know the difference between a manual steering and a power steering? Okay, so okay, basically, uh, way back. So, have you seen lorry drivers when they are turning a truck? They put on big dosa, like, oh, like you know, they pull. it's very heavy, you know, because you need all your strength. I, I drove a manual Nano, Tata Nano. You know, it was hard for me to turn the Nano with the manual steering. Because it's heavy, you're you're feeling the weight of the vehicle, the car. Imagine lorry, and then you see power steering, all these Volvo buses and all sits and like you know just one finger, you know, just like make it look like it's a you know it's like yeah, I'm just putting a dosa, you know, <laughs> it's like piece of cake, you know, and you see that in the context of our Christian walk is when we try to do things on our by ourselves in our own strength. It's a struggle. We toil and sweat and whatnot. But the Holy Spirit comes into the picture and he says, like, okay, hey, hey, let me help you. You know, he comes and be, uh, you know, he's the wind in our sails. He just pushes us, you know, eases everything that what we have to do. Um, so that's what Ephesians 3.16 talks about. And uh, let's actually read one more scripture, which we are very, very familiar with in Ephesians 5.18. Uh, Ephesians 5.18, we all know this verse. It says, do not be drunk with wine. For that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Be filled with the Spirit. Um, so most of us Christians, we follow the first commandment very, very well. First part of the commandments. Do not get drunk with the Holy, holy. You know? so, but what about the second part of that commandment? Right? You think by not, not doing something creates a void which needs to be filled with something else. Isn't it? It just can't be empty. Otherwise, sevenfold will come back. <laughs> Isn't it? So 
you don't be drunk, you don't do something, but then you do the good thing or the godly thing is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, so that's what it's talking about a church that has a balanced teaching of good doctrine on the word of God and of the spirit of God. Because there are churches, there are uh what do I say? Certain streams of Christianity that emphasizes only on the one thing and forgets the other. It's both ways, right? Um, so we don't need to go deep into that. Um so some of and as we do that, there are five areas, focus areas that gets strengthened or needs to be strengthened in any local church. It's in the notes that the first thing talks about is evangelism, evangelism, discipleship, prayer and worship, fellowship, and equipping for ministry. Okay, evangelism, uh, going to all the world, right? Share the good news, baptizing them, bringing them in. Okay, so. Uh, Evangelism has to be more than okay, okay. What comes to your mind when you talk about evangelism? What are some of the different ways in how you evangelize? <laughs> Sorry, giving the good news. Yeah. Okay. So, what have what are some of the methods you've seen being used for this? Uh, thing called evangelism one to one okay right one to one yeah tracks you don't see that nowadays much isn't it yeah mm, street evangelism okay so one to one tracks street evangelism evangelism crusades which used to happen so much, uh, we don't see that happening a lot nowadays. Uh, evangelism crusades, it was huge, isn't it? Um, and then, so yeah, we are in a time and age we, where we cannot just limit ourselves to these things, you know, that used to happen. Okay, street evangelism, tracks, uh, and whatnot. So before joining APC, I was part of this organization called Christian Vision. Uh, yes, he is. That was a branch of it. That's you. Sometimes you would see me wearing a T-shirt called Yes, he is. Um, so we had an app called Yes, he is, and uh, the motto of the, that organization or that wing of the organization was to uh, do evangelism, but online. And so we had that app where we and we would create videos uh, that you know, like anything Christian values and whatnot. And at the end of it, um, so the di difference between a video on YouTube and the video on our app, it, this app was for Christians to share their faith. It's so like, you know, if you know someone who's struggling with anxiety or, or whatever, different challenges, we will make variety of videos. Uh, we will share it to them. They will watch it. The difference is at the end of that video, uh, there's a prompt. Would you like to get in touch with the team and talk more about it? Uh, and then the end goal was the end goal was to connect that person to a church, a local church from wherever they are calling. And so, like that, we've had people from all across India uh, connect right to us who would have watched a video, uh, who've gone through so many different things from people from every different background. Uh, and then we were able to connect them to a local church from wherever they were calling. So, you think about evangelism, we don't think about none of the answers was about online. But online evangelism is pretty huge now, isn't it? Uh, so you start thinking about different ways. Um, I know a friend who started a coffee shop, and he started uh, hiring all these, uh, you know, people uh, who could not afford, uh, you know, with great qualities of life. And then he would train them how to make coffee uh, and whatnot. And in that process, he would share with them uh, about Jesus and all of that. You see, there are so many different ways. When you lean into God's heart, He gives you strategy. He gives you a vision, right? Uh, how you can evangelize. So uh, you know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, the principle remains the same, but the methods change. And so, for us to be updated, uh, <laughs> it's very important, uh, you know, to learn more about evangelism, different ways to evangelize. It's very important because that's how your church will grow as well, isn't it? Um, so one of the words in the f the first two words it says in that evangelism part it says we equip God's people. Equip is very important because most of the times it's very simple for me to say, all right, go and evangelize today. How? Where? What? Why? When? 
You see that all those philosophical journalistic questions will come into play, right? And so you equip them. That's why we have uh, lifestyle evangelism that teaches us how to evangelize, isn't it? So that's what is it doing? It's equipping us how to evangelize, right? So evangelism is important. Uh, discipleship is crucial. Discipleship uh, was huge in the, during the time of Jesus' uh, era in Galilee. This, this method of discipleship was born in this place called Galilee. Uh, and no wonder Jesus made it his like you know headquarters for his ministry base, you know. Um, so discipleship was pretty it, it, the goal of a disciple was simple: is that he would look exactly like his rabbi at the end of the course. You can't be a disciple forever. There was a certain period of time, right? So uh, again, just a brief background, a cultural background is uh, in the Jewish system. If you are a kid, you will be put into Bible college at the age of two. It starts from there, two or three. By the time you are eight, you know the entire Old Testament by heart. It's called the Tanakh, not just the Torah. Torah is the first five books. <laughs> it's Tanakh is a Tanakh is a mixture of Torah, uh, its poetry, and also the prophets. So it's yeah, it's the whole of Old Testament. They know it by heart by the age of eight or nine. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a Jewish thing. Okay, to everybody, it's it's the first thing. What they do is they join, and I, I forget the Hebrew name for it. It's uh, so. Here's the thing. So once they graduate from that level, that's the first level or whatever you know. Um, the next thing is the student has a choice. That is, one is to follow in the profession of the family. So the family could have be a fisherman. It could be whatever of those days. They could continue to follow into their family's profession, or if they could afford, they can go and approach a, uh, a rabbi and say, can I be your disciple for the studies? And then the rabbi would gauge and think and, and you know do an interview and then decide, OK, yeah, you're worthy to become my disciple. You can follow along with me. Did you hear what I just said? Disciple would go to rabbi and say, can I be your disciple? What did Jesus do? It's beautiful what Jesus did, right? Uh, and so the end of it is the goal is for us in our context in the New Covenant is that we would look like Jesus, that we would do, you know, that we would sound like how he would sound, that we would portray, we would, uh, we use the word represent, isn't it? It's simply being, a re it's a representing right represent jesus to the world uh in our in our christ-like character conduct and service we teach people how to live word of god in everyday life etc okay uh, prayer and worship of course fellowship um, and then equipping for ministry okay equipping for ministry i want us to look at uh let's go to ephesians chapter 4 please Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 onwards. I'll read it for us. Okay, Ephesians 4, verse 11, it says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. I'm reading from ESV, okay. Um, okay he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, uh, or pastors, or teachers. Why? In verse 12. To equip the saints, right, to God's people, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Okay, see the progression of it. He gave all of these fivefold ministry to equip the saints, that is us, the people of God. Why? So that the people of God will do the work of the ministry. So what is happening? Everybody thinks the work of the ministry is responsibility of the pastors, teachers, apostles. Our responsibility is to equip the saints. That's the mind. Huh? 
Right. So equipping of ministry is very crucial. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a pretty big culture, at least here in APC is uh, like, you know, there's a huge focus on equipping the church. Uh, why we do subjects like healing and deliverance and we keep emphasizing that everybody can do everybody can do everybody can do and not just the pastors and uh, you, you know uh, is for this sake is that they would do the work of the ministry we equip them you go do the work of the ministry that's why this fivefold ministry has been given isn't it so that's um so all of these fivefold uh five different uh, areas that strengthens the local church or makes the strong church more stronger okay uh, the next part is uh, preparing for pulpit ministry. Uh, again, don't forget the title of this chapter, What Makes a Local Church Strong? Uh, and so it, uh, part of that is talking about the pulpit ministry. That means a person who's standing behind the pulpit and giving the word of God or whatever is being happening from the pulpit ministry is not taken lightly. Right? You look at that opportunity. Uh, you might not necessarily have a pulpit in front of you. Okay, but you look at that opportunity as God given. It's not some 30, 40 minutes. Okay, I, this is the next another Sunday thing. It's a routine now. I'm just going to, you know, speak out of inspiration without preparation and then take a vacation. Uh, you know, so, <laughs> all right. So, each opportunity that we have to stand behind the pulpit to minister God's word uh, must be done with a definite purpose. Um, and so, some of the areas that Pastor Ashish has put down and that what he focuses and how to or uh, the topics that he likes to cover in a year, uh, which I'll share in just a second. Uh, he focuses on these three areas, which is Christian life, which talks about teaching people how to live in the Christian life, for example, developing in disciplines in prayer, reading God's word, walk of faith, etc., and life skills, teaching people how to live God's word in daily life situations. Uh, those are life skills and ministry, teaching people how to minister and serve others, etc. So these are... and. The, the topics can vary, but it focuses how it's birthed or born out of these three uh, main areas. Okay, um, so let me just share a screen. Um, this is just an insight uh, into the sermon plan. Can you all see that? You can see now? Okay. All right, I forgot not all of you are online. Okay. You can see? Okay, cool. Okay. I gave you? Right, so that is the uh, sermon plan, uh, initial sermon plan that pastor put for the entire year. The, this is the pulpit plan, right? Um, so he, he shares it with me so I can work on the worship team roster and plan the songs accordingly. But, you know, in the notes, if you see in Isaiah 46, it says he knows the end from the beginning. So, you know, you seek God not just for one Sunday sermon. You seek God for the entire year. See what he, you know, all the topics that he wants to give. Uh, and if, if you go through this entire plan or the sermon plan, you will see all the three areas being, uh, you know, uh, addressed in a one year sermon plan. All, your, all of you are looking at this, right? I, I, if you want it, I'll share this plan with you later. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, again, he's. So he's the plan is here, right? Now he's moved around a few things. Like for example, in the month of August, we did a different series. Uh, we are doing the series on Thessalonians this month, right? Uh, so he, but you know, an overall plan is there, and then you can be flexible to move things around and whatnot. So taking pulpit ministry seriously. That's what it is. <laughs> right? It keeps a strong uh, local church, makes a strong local church. And another thing, what you all mentioned is, um, and that this, you know, what talk about the pulpit ministry actually challenged me. When I had to plan for uh, youth youth ministry, uh, you know, is I had to have all the subject, different topics for a year. 
I am I'm very different. Okay. <laughs> I I deal life one day at a time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like uh, yeah, because tomorrow has its own troubles. Why you know <laughs> I'm like that sometimes. Uh, you know, one Sunday at a time. Oh, okay, maximum one month at a time. <laughs> Two months is beyond me. <laughs> One year is, uh, yeah, I need, uh, like, you know, someone has to lay hands on me and, uh, you know, <laughs> impart some wisdom and all. So, but they're challenged. And what you said is true, isn't it? So, but when you look at it in a year, how many Sundays are there? 53, 54, right? And he said something that actually, you know, made it look very different from a different perspective. He said, I have only 52 Sundays the where I can act 52 times, like, you know, is where I can actually impart something to equip my congregation. Right? It's not one entire year. When you look at it as a one big year, 365 days, it looks big. But when you bring it down to just 52 days uh, and 52 days and one hour. It's not 52 days, not 24 hours. I just have one hour. And so maybe 52 hours. And that's very less, isn't it, to achieve what you want to accomplish everything in one year. Um, so yeah, having a strong pulpit plan ministry is very important, essential. Yeah, yeah. So I have always had the flexibility to change things because so yeah, you know, I might or I can just make a list of all the topics that I want to cover uh, and then, you know, put it and then but you're leaning on God's guidance for every season. Right. And suddenly something might stand out. It's like, OK, I feel like doing this topic now because I feel like it's what God's doing in the season. So let's do this, uh, and that's always happened. So, and you and you also have to be flexible; can't be too rigid about it. Yes, yes, have to be flexible. Yeah, that's pulpit ministry, um, and a church where people are uh, of one heart and one mind. Okay, can someone read that? First Corinthians one ten in your notes, if you will, please. First Corinthians 1.10 Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there is no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Yeah. Okay, and Mark 3.25 and if a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. Uh, the church is known as the house of God, right? Uh, the household of God. Uh, and if there's division within, it's it cannot stand, isn't it? So he's emphasizing to the church of Corinth. Uh, so P Apostle Paul has observed uh, some things in the church of Corinth and that he's wanting to address that uh, there is no unity among them. Uh, but he's encouraging, uh, you know, everybody to just be in, in in the same mind. And there's something about unity, isn't it? Uh, it like, again, Acts chapter one and two, it says they were all gathered together in one accord, and then the Holy Spirit fell. Right? Uh, they were, uh, and uh, time and time again in the Old Testament, in First Chronicles chapter sixteen, uh, uh, and so many other times, we see where the priests blew their trumpet uh, trumpet at one in one unity when they lifted up their voice in in uh, as one then the spirit of the lord came the cloud of god came down um and so unity is huge that's what he mentioned isn't it francis uh, so unity in church that makes a strong local church and again that is just one point a big major point and you can work towards okay how can i make my church be united right uh, it, it's very important uh, how do I help my congregation stay united, be united? Uh, and that's a question that you need to lean on, lean into God's heart and get answers from. But it's it's a very important uh, thing to have. Um, 
the football team that I support is absolutely a mess. They only have United in their name. <laughs> Nothing is United about them at the moment. <laughs> it's so irritating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another important point is a church that is equipping and releasing people into their God-appointed function or destiny is crucial, right? We are again going back to that scripture, Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, which we just read a couple of minutes ago. Um, <clears throat> is you push the people uh, into, you know, into the God, uh, God appointed calling or function. You, you recognize, you know, you say, okay, Anand has this incredible quality uh, of, a, of a teacher or whatever. You equip him, you encourage him, and you release him. Right, you don't immediately. Think, okay, he's got he's got amazing talent. I'm going to keep him right next to me forever and ever. Sign the contract right now. It's like put it in. It's like next 25 years, you're bound to my church. You break this contract, you have to pay me 25 lakhs. Okay, so <laughs> you know bonded labor. Uh, you know, there's no point in holding the sand tight, isn't it? You kind of it, it will still continue to go out of your hand, but there's some. Is such a beauty in releasing people. There's such joy in just watching the people you have nurtured, that you have equipped, are now doing the Lord's work, isn't it? There's such a beauty. There's such so much joy in that. Jesus did that. He could have you know, just said, "Okay, I'm going to change the world all by myself." Why did he have to choose twelve disciples and then go? Right, um, and so equipping and releasing people into God's appointed function is very important, and that's another quality of a very good of a good leader is that you are able to discern. I, as leaders, I'll tell you this: I've experienced this in my life. As leaders, we have the privilege of seeing a bigger picture of a person's life. Most of the times, you know, and the people, young people that I get to lead and whatnot. Uh, why do I say, you know, when they ask me certain advice and whatnot, uh, it's like I guide them, direct them, okay, no, this is not a good idea, this was not, is because you see the bigger picture, okay, and hopefully the decision is coming from the right place, is you want the best for them, isn't it? Uh, but as leaders, we have this incredible um, privilege to see this bigger picture and, and discern, right? You see, the word discern is associated with the word wisdom. When God talks to Solomon in his dream, Solomon is talking back to God in his dream. That's beyond me, okay? But Solomon doesn't ask for wisdom. He actually asks, help me to discern that I may lead people well. God later translates, okay, you don't know what you're asking for. What you need is wisdom. What you're asking for is actually wisdom. You hear what I'm saying, right? And so, as leaders, you, you, with wisdom, you discern, you know, what's the destiny that God has for you, 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 and then you kind of push them, right, towards the destiny that God has planned for them. Okay. Um, and then the next section is the a church that is relevant to the world it is in. This is a very interesting topic. A church that is relevant to the world that it is in. Okay. Question. Question time. <laughs> is the church relevant for today's day and age? That means, do we need church in this day and age? Yeah. Is it relevant? More than ever. Why? Why is the church relevant? That's the first question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Why is the church relevant? It's also for those online. Okay, please feel free. Yeah. Because that's what uh, God intended. Like, we should know the God through preaching, and uh, somebody has to tell people about the word. Um, and Jesus coming back now. So all the more, <laughs> we have no time. Yeah. Okay. Jesus is coming back soon. <laughs> Jesus, please come back soon, you're saying. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Lord, come back soon, Lord. I don't like my classmates. <laughs> okay, yeah, go on, go on, tell me. Yeah. Why is the church relevant? Uh, to correct and show the people, like to show what is a actually what is life actually. Okay. So you know, one of the huge argument from the world today is, why do we have to follow a book that is so old? It's just another book that tells us how to live life, how to do life. It's not relevant to this day and age. It doesn't make sense. It's not contextually right. That is the real argument. Is Jesus relevant to this day and age? It's a very serious question to think, uh, you know, and because I'm asking the question, why is that's exactly what you will be asked by the world? Why and how? Tell me. Right? Um, and so it's it's a point for us to all ponder. Uh, there's a scripture that is mentioned there, First Corinthians chapter nine, verse nineteen to twenty-three in your in your notes. Uh, but I want to read from the Message version. Okay, um, this is Apostle Paul again. He's explaining uh, how he is trying to be relevant to the audience that he is leading, or that he is preaching to. Right. Um, so if you can go to the Message version or find the Message version online. You have the permission to use your phone. <laughs> yeah, First Corinthians chapter nine, verse nineteen to twenty-three. I'll I'll read it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Nina John, for sharing. It's called yeah, it's called out body representing Jesus Christ. Absolutely vital to the point, people to Christ. Yeah. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 23 in the message version. It says, even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone. That means he's saying he does not have to meet anyone's expectation. There is no expectation set on him. Right? He's free of the demands and expectations of everyone. I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. I have voluntarily become a servant just so I can be relevant to a wide range of people. That's what he's saying. Religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose, life, loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. If you if highlight that, okay? I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ. But I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet in God's saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I want to be in on it. Talk about a leader. Okay, there was a, you know, there's a, Global Leadership Summit that happens every year, GLS it's called, um, and uh, one of the, a panel had to decide and define leadership in one word. They were given some hours of time, and uh, they said, "Okay, if a leadership could be defined with one word, uh, it's the word." Any idea? Take a guess. One word that was used to define leadership by this panel. Come on, those online. Wait, wild guess. Servant. What else? Okay. So, I beg your pardon. Accountable. No. 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 
slave no prabhu inspiration very close dear friends but it's not the one oh <laughs> Motivator. What did you say? Influence. Influence. Yeah. Um, so they came up. A leader will always influence. So leadership is not about position. You can still not be have the title of a leader, but influence the entire class. It could be a bad thing or a good thing. You can have good influence, or you can have bad influence. isn't it so what apostle paul is saying here is that i voluntarily stepped into their world but i did not conform to their ways that means i did not i did not allow them to influence me what i try to do is influence them it's dangerous territory if you're not strong in god that sal okay i'm going to look like them i'm going to do everything like them because i want to influence them the next thing you know is you're being influenced by them it's like hey pass the drag this pass on you know <laughs> you know what i'm saying um so look at now the actual version uh, uh, in the notes first corinthians 9 uh, 1923 it says for though i am free from all men i have made myself a servant to all that i might win the more and to the jews i become became as a jew that i might win jews to those who are under the law that he's talking about the gentiles as under the law that i might win those who are under the law okay and those who are without law as without law it's like almost like a tongue twister isn't it like okay paul what are you trying to say right now you know um but think about it jews had their own way of living life gentiles had their own ways of living life right imagine the i mean the knowledge and the wisdom that paul must have had and the strength of the holy spirit that he must have had to in, have influence on all these different cultural uh, you know people ethnicity and what not are you guys with me so far understanding following yeah the point we are talking about was is the church relevant to the world and why and how can we uh, you know be relevant uh, to the world okay salt and light okay <laughs> All right, and just a couple more other points. One last thing is a church that is raising up leaders. I want to combine this point with the next one: a church that is able to establish continuity. Okay, it's one one and the same. So, uh, kind of a church that is raising up leaders and a church that is able to establish continuity. Okay, Galatians two nine it says, and when James, Caiaphas, and uh, John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. they gave me and barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the gentiles and that and they to be and and they to the circumcised that means they were raising up leaders they came with a game plan and say okay you go minister to the gentiles we'll go minister to the jews okay they were raising up leaders they're equipping them right and they're going out to minister to do the work of a ministry and then the next point says and the church that is able to establish continuity So second Timothy 2 1 and 2 it says you therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ and the things that you may have heard from me among many witnesses commit these to the faithful men who will be able to teach others also So what is he saying is he's simply saying that your your position there is not permanent that means you <laughs> it's not permanent right very quickly let's just uh, wait let me just find that verse let's go to the book of numbers i hope i it's the right verse please be right okay let's go to numbers chapter 8 verse 25 very quickly okay numbers 8:25 okay numbers chapter 8 verse 25 it says and from the age of 50 years they shall withdraw from the duty of the service and serve no more what is it talking about they're talking about the levitical priests okay it says okay all right you will be serving as priests that means you will have a certain responsibility but when you hit 50 retire 
your responsibilities will change and then younger men will come and take the place okay so it's biblical to have continuity like you know it's uh, okay, i'm going to i'm i started off as a senior pastor i'm going to die as a senior pastor without any continuity after i die and go the church is going to perish nobody is going to be there uh, you know there is no plan there is no plan of continuity etc etc right and that is not a mark of a strong local church are you guys with me yeah so to have you are constantly raising up leaders you are equipping them and then you are preparing for continuity you are planning ahead okay so what is going to happen when i'm gone right are you all with me okay so all of these points are are points for what makes a strong local church uh, any thoughts or comments questions Passing from the beginning part of this chapter, um, is vision and calling same? Vision? And calling the same thing. Is vision and the calling the same? Huh. I think it kind of goes hand in hand, but it's the same but different. I don't know how to define it. Like. Uh, you can have a calling but have but still not have vision for ex for example i have a calling to i have i have a call to serve the youth for example how where you know the vision so I, it's it seems so generic isn't it like i have a calling for the worship ministry i have a calling for healing ministry that's my calling god has called me to do healing ministry okay so where's the vision what what is the vision what are you going to do? Where are you going to play? You know, set your base. How are you going to establish that ministry? So that's the vision part of it. So you can have a calling and still not have vision. You know what I'm saying? The vision is something that gets me there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Many are called, few are chosen. Uh, having a calling and no vision, but see, you at least have a calling, yeah. right? So you know, okay, yeah. this is what I'm called to do, and so now it is your responsibility to wait on God. Okay, Lord, okay, Lord, you've called me to do this. I think most of us can relate to that, isn't it? Lord, you've called me for this. Uh, what do you want me to do? Show me. How do I do this? Yes. And also, if uh, if I know what God called me to do, then uh, like you told, right? If you have a calling, uh, we have to wait on God for vision. Yeah. And is it like necessary? Like my question is like, if I know what I have to do, is it not like I have to work on it? How to do instead of having a waiting for God to give a vision? Is it not like God is like God? I already told you, God is telling like I already told you you have to start a church. So you should go use the resources and start. Yeah. Or is it like I have to wait and God show me vision on how to do it? So, so everything is given at that time, isn't it? So you have a calling. And uh, so again, God tells you what to do, uh, uh, you know, what you can do. And, and and there are other common things like what you just said, like things that are common sense, uh, uh, you know, that you can that you can work on on yourself, like to upskill yourself. Um, so yeah. So when we know our calling, we have to do the both. So we have to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, yes. And along the process, that he will guide you. No. Um, so again, when God calls Abraham, God tells he's calling Abraham. Right? He says, leave your father's house, leave your land and go. What does he say? Go to the place. I will show you. That means he didn't show. Right. But Abraham responded. Right. He, he left and he went not knowing where exactly. 
but along the way he becomes very intimate with his walk with god so yeah so pastor would you call um the like we have the kairos and the chronos moment in our lives mm -hmm. so would you call the kairos moment in our lives the vision and the chronos the calling no i haven't complicated it so much <laughs> like uh, so it, 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 every season it changes okay kairos and chronos how many of you all know the difference But what's the actual definition of Kronos? Where does it come from? The word. Yeah. See, Chronicles, chronology comes from the word Kronos, right? It's the actual time. Like what's, you know, in order. Uh, Kairos is the divine time, as you, you know, like what you are defining, saying. So uh, it's, like I said, I haven't complicated like that. Um, so what do you want to know? <laughs> is Kairos yeah. your vision? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so Kronos again is different, isn't it? So it's it's almost like the natural part of it. Like it's not connected. Kronos is different, Kairos is different. That's why they are two different words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that we are, yeah, we are talking about one thing, and we are, it's, it's very different things. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. But then, okay, just to make you feel happy, okay, so he might share some of the things with you in his right, in the right time. That could be your Kairos moment, <laughs> if you want to know, right? Uh, and so, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Nina. Kairos is the appointed time, yeah. OK, we'll uh, stop here, uh, and uh, we'll continue having this discussion. But thank you for joining in, everybody. God bless you. Have a good one.